summer evening to the fifth of eight webinars in our 2020 Ocean Currents Lecture Series. Um, we're giving the late arrivees just a few seconds to log on. My name is Joe Scudlark. I'm the Assistant Director at the University of Delaware School of Marine Science and Policy. Before introducing tonight's speaker, there's just one small bit of housekeeping. If you have questions, we would ask that you use the Q&A um, icon at the bottom to type in your questions. And then as time allows, at the end of the talk, uh, Mark Jolly from our communication office will be moderating the questions to direct to uh, our speaker. Tonight, it gives me genuine pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Cohen, who is an associate professor at the School of Marine Science and Policy. John came to us having earned his doctorate in biology at Duke University, and his research interests include comparative physiology and behavior in marine animals, neurobiology, visual ecology, zooplankton ecology, and polar biology. Tonight's talk is on a very uh, environmentally relevant topic these days. Um, John will be telling us about the sources, distribution, and fate of plastics in the local marine environment. So I give you Dr. John Cohen. Well, great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, let me just share my, share my screen here. Great. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Again, thank you, uh, thank you all for, for joining us uh, this evening. Um, I wish I could be talking to you in person, but I'm happy to, happy to do it in this context, and I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to join. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we've been doing on um, marine plastic pollution, um, a focus on Delaware, of course, but um, a lot of what I'll talk about is really applicable beyond Delaware. And so um, let me just go ahead and, um, and get right to it. Um, so again, as Joe mentioned, I'm at this, the School of Marine Science and Policy within the College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment at University of Delaware. Um, the work we've been doing on microplastics um, has, been, has been funded by um, a number of organizations, um, NOAA through the Sea Grant Program, the National Science Foundation, and also the State of Delaware and the NOAA Marine Debris Program, um, as well as private donations. Um, so we've been fortunate um, to, um, to be able to conduct this work uh, through these uh, generous sources of funding. And I guess I would, I also just want to make the point um, that this is not a sort of a one person effort. Um, it's actually a, a huge team that's responsible for a lot of what I'll talk about today. And so, um, you know, that includes graduate students, Hayden Betcher, um, Anna Inner Nicola, um, who work in my laboratory. Um, we've, we've been fortunate to have support from our elected officials as well. Here's Senator Carper talking to Hayden, um, Alan Mason, another graduate student, um, Taylor Hoffman, and a new graduate student, Julia Fontana, as well. Um, are contributing to the work that we do and many, many other students. Um, so this is a, 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 a topic that, that really engages um, undergraduates and graduate students alike. And so it's been, been great to work with these, these bright, bright, bright people, as well as my colleagues, Tobias Kokulka, Helga Huntley, and Tracy Deliberty um, at UD, um, who are instrumental in a lot of the work we do. So let me start by, by asking the question, why should we care about plastic in the environment? Um, so it's what I'm going to talk about tonight, but why should, we, why should we care? Well, I see three reasons to really think about this. Um, one is health, and that's um, ecological health as well as potentially human health, um, which has been related to issues with, with plastic pollution in the, in the environment. Um, so we want to be able to think about those things. The second is environmental stewardship. Um, it's, at least to me, it doesn't seem right to, um, to use the, the natural world basically as our dump. And so, um, so one of the ways to think about, think about uh, this issue is um, the extent to which we're comfortable um, with pollution in the environment. Um, and so that's, that's another reason to potentially care about this issue. And a third, I think, is social justice. It's not quite as obvious to people, but um, Plastic pollution is often linked with poverty as well, and that's at a, a local, regional, and global scale. And so um, the more um, that you think about plastic pollution as an issue, the more I think you see it as a social justice issue. 
It's not something I'm going to talk a lot about today, but it's, a, it's an interesting topic that I think is worth pursuing a little bit more. So um, before I start too much, though, I want to talk about plastic in a very good way. I think plastic is really useful stuff, and hopefully you do as well. Uh, plastic is flexible, watertight, shatterproof, durable, light. It's easy to mold. It insulates heat like this coffee cup. It insulates electricity and the wiring in your house and your light switches. Um, think about medical goods as well. You very much want these things made out of plastic and, and disposable, your IV bags, for example. So plastic is, is really good and useful, useful material. The issue with it in the environment is that it takes a really long time to break down. And so, you know, compare an apple core with a few months to break down to plastic bags, cans, plastic bottles, and monofilament fishing line, which is meant to be really strong and not break. And you're, you can see how long it takes for this material to, uh, to break down in the environment. So, um, so that's really um, sort of what, um, what we want to think about. There are positives to plastic, but also some pretty serious negatives when it's in the environment. Um, and then there's always the question of will it actually break down and what does it mean to break down? But that's again, another, another story. Um, so for this evening's talk, I want to focus in a few areas. Um, first, how do we get here? Um, how is it that we're talking about plastic pollution? How did, how did we end up here? The second, um, I just want to introduce some big issues surrounding plastic pollution and how research um, is informing those issues. And then I'd just like to finish with where we go from here, some thoughts about options for, um, for, for moving along with plastic in the future. So a little movie clip. Exactly, how do you mean? It's a great future in plastics. Think about it. What do you think about it? Yes, I will. Enough said. That's a deal. So that iconic uh, scene from, from The Graduate, um, which I suspect you, you know, um, sort of brings, brings home the idea that plastics, plastics are a thing to get involved in. And this cartoon slide sort of discusses global plastic production and what it was like from the, you know, the graduate was in the late 60s um, through to the future, what plastic looks like from maybe the, the straw perspective. If we look at it a little bit more realistically, um, you see something like this. There was a post-World War II surge in plastic production as the chemistry of plastic was worked out and then the utility of it um, was realized. And so what you're seeing here is a nice um, infographic from National Geographic starting in the 1950s through, in this case, 2015, this exponential increase in global plastic production. And it's broken out by category. The graduate was right here in 1967. So you can see that's a pretty, pretty spot on. Plastics is a great thing to get involved in. Um, if you see here, packaging is this pink color. That's um, making up a large portion of the material that, um, that, that global plastic production goes towards. And you can also see the average time for plastic packaging is less than six months. And in fact, it's often less than that. So, um, you know, plastic wrappers on, on a, a sandwich, for example, might last a lot, a very short time in, in the time that I actually had it longer for the, the actual product. Um, so you can see plastic production is on the rise and it, it, it is um, in, in the extreme. So 2015, I was estimated that half of all plastic ever manufactured was made in the last 15 years. And again, disposable packaging um, is over 40% of, of the use of globally produced plastic. So um, we live in a plastic society and, and we're generating a lot of plastic. Um, if you ask the question, who's producing that plastic? Um, this is um, a very similar graphic here showing plastic production. The size of these boxes is proportional to how many millions of tons in 2013 um, the global plastic production uh, reached for various countries. 65% of the production of plastic was in China, Europe, and North America. Perhaps not surprisingly, but it does sort of show you where the bolus of that material is, is coming from, at least in the production side. It's an interesting question to ask what's happening to all that plastic. And so there was a paper that came out in the scientific literature a few years ago, um, and it, it did sort of a, a budget for um, all the plastic that's ever been made. Um, so um, how much was produced from 1950 to 2015 in millions of metric tons. And it showed 
um, where that material is now. And so about 29% was in use um, somewhere, whether it's um, as, as its raw material, its virgin material, or as recycled material. Um, so that's 29% of what's been produced so far. Um, over 55% was in, in discarded waste. So it had been discarded, it's not used anymore. 9% had been incinerated, and about 7% is wrapped up in recycling. Um, so it's, I'm gonna come back to this recycling point a little bit later. Um, that's a fairly low number, but the vast majority is, is either discarded or incinerated, so it's out of the picture that way, but not perhaps ultimately. So I want to turn a little bit to ocean plastic. And so where does ocean plastic come from? So that's plastic production, but where does ocean plastic come from? And so um, you have global plastic production, and then you have plastic waste. So waste material, the discarded material. Um, then there's coastal plastic waste. So that plastic waste that's generated near the coasts. And then you have mismanaged plastic waste that's coastal. And so some proportion of that coastal plastic waste um, isn't going to be retained in landfills, it's not going to be collected, um, so there's some issue with the management of that waste, um, and ultimately some portion of that mismanaged waste is going potentially will be released into the ocean. It's been estimated at 8 million metric tons of plastic um, going in um, per year in 2010. And then there's plastic already in the ocean, so it's this cycle of, of um, plastic production, plastic waste, coastal plastic waste, mismanagement of that waste, and then um, inputs into the ocean. That equivalent um, of 8 million metric tons is about 2.4 million dumpsters per year, just to give you a sense of, of the, the amount. So one thing that often comes up is recycling. And I mentioned that that recycling number was fairly low of, of the total global plastic production. I think it's interesting to think about recycling and whether recycling is the answer to the plastic problem. And, and I'm not convinced that it necessarily is. Um, it's a relatively small pathway for the waste, as I talked about. Um, and you also have to think, just from a U.S. perspective, um, where is our waste going? So in terms of ocean plastic is where I'm really coming from, and we'll get back to that. So China um, has cut imports of U.S. plastic waste starting in about 2017. Um, so our recycled waste was sent, was sent there, but not so much anymore. Um, we then started sending it to other countries um, in Asia in particular. Um, so Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam in particular um, were receiving more of our waste. And that's kind of shown down here in these plots. Um, and then um, as those waste levels started to rise, the recycling that we were sending um, started to rise, there were then restrictions from a variety of countries um, to reduce that um, acceptance of that waste. And now new waste markets are emerging, Turkey and in Africa, for example. Again, that's shown in these, in these plots here on the right. This is all from, from um, an article in The Guardian, which if you're interested in this topic is, is an interesting one to look at. Um, so um, just realize that the issue of recycling isn't as neat and tidy as, as it might appear. And it's also a relatively small portion of at least our current uh, budget for how plastic waste is dealt with. I wanna come back to sending waste to some of these countries in a moment. So, so hang tight there. So what we know of ocean plastic is what I've already said, mismanaged waste enters the ocean. Um, and it's often from land derived waste coming through rivers. And what this graph or this, this map is showing you are bubbles showing you plastic inputs from rivers where the larger the bubble, the more plastic waste is input. The shading on the, the map is showing you mismanaged plastic waste at a global scale. And what you're seeing is the areas I was just mentioning are areas where we, we in particular the US, send our plastic waste, or at least our recycling. And so um, we're sending material to places that often have highly mismanaged waste themselves. Um, so we're diverting plastic waste to areas that are dealing with their own um, waste issues. And then plastic is accumulating in the oceans, we know that. And so that's kind of what, what we know of the situation. So then what happens when plastic gets into the oceans? And so I'm just gonna play um, a short little video to, to give you a sense of, of how the oceans work. And so what you're seeing is a NASA um, a visualization of currents, global ocean currents. And so one thing, if you're not too familiar with the ocean, um, is to realize that ocean currents are global and they're highly organized. They're often beautiful to look at too. This visualization is really, really striking aesthetically. Um, 
And the one thing that always gets me when I look at this is just look at how connected the oceans are, right? And so you see, imagine material floating around the ocean. It's going to be moved in various places and it's gonna gather in various places due to the actions of these gyres and eddies and all this swirling, swirling water in a highly organized fashion. So, you know, as we're going over Africa here, we're sort of coming up, um, coming up towards, towards Asia. Um, and so you're gonna see, um, and you're gonna see the, the way these currents move. It's just a really striking thing. But to me, it gives the sense that the oceans really are connected and material in one portion of, of the ocean are going to, be, going to be moved around and again, gather. So this has been conceptualized um, for a few years now um, in the idea of garbage patches. And so, um, and these have gotten a lot of publicity where there are, there are areas of the ocean that I was just showing you um, relating to the circulation patterns that are gathering plastic material. And it drew a lot of concern when this was first realized. And so you, you see these garbage patches in the ocean, um, particularly the Eastern Pacific um, and the Western Pacific garbage patches. So the one thing though that we're starting to realize in the past five or so years is that this view of plastic in the ocean isn't necessarily the correct one. Yes, they exist, but this probably isn't the, the worst of it. What is, what is the worst of it is something that's far more insidious and that's very small pieces of plastic. So these are sort of five millimeter sized particles or smaller. So imagine the, the width of a pencil eraser, that sort of the upper size limit of what we call microplastics. These are indeed the most abundant form of marine debris, marine plastic pollution. We see them on beaches, we see them at the sea surface, we see them in deep sea sediments, we see them in Arctic sea ice, and we see them in the remote mountains of the Pyrenees, as well as, as I already mentioned, Arctic sea ice, but also in the Antarctic too. And so um, it can be moved around by ocean currents. They can be carried by the wind. Um, it's really um, the very, an insidious form of pollution. So a little bit more on microplastics. They can be primary microplastics or secondary microplastics. And so when we talk about primary microplastics, we're talking about material that's manufactured to be small. And so you can see on Abraham Lincoln's head, a few microbeads, for example, these are primary microplastics. In contrast, secondary microplastics are things that were larger and then they're breaking down. So bottle caps, pen caps, rope, um, various larger macroplastic pieces that can break down into smaller and smaller pieces. And so once this material is in the water, it breaks down, plastics break down again, um, you have a larger plastic item, it breaks down to a smaller plastic particle, then microplastics, eventually nanoplastics, and then oligomers and chemical fragments of that material. And so I already mentioned this pencil eraser size, if you just sort of get that in your head, to basically the width of a human hair is sort of this microplastic going into the nanoplastic range. So that's the size scale we're talking about. And various factors are going to influence this breakdown, um, ultraviolet light, the physical stress of moving through the water, um, salinity, microbes, fluctuating temperatures, biofilms, all can affect plastic uh, breakdown. And then what happens to that material as it breaks down? There are additives, plasticizers that can leach out of the plastic. Um, the plastic itself or the plasticizers can have adverse effects on organisms. Biofilms can form on that material, microbial, um, um, consortia develop on what's what's termed the plastosphere and then um, affect the buoyancy, for example, of that material or perhaps the likelihood of other organisms ingesting it. And then um, we're dealing with material that could be distributed throughout the water column at that point and then moved around by currents. So instead of floating garbage patches, what I hope you're starting to see is that the ocean plastic pollution is really more like a soup. And so imagine sort of a very, a very delicate soup with lots of little things in it, not big chunks floating at the surface necessarily all the time. It's true that you see that, but perhaps the, the thing to really think about and perhaps be a little bit more concerned about is the degraded material that's much smaller. So that could be at the sea surface, it could be in the biota, it could be in the water column, um, it could be in the seafloor or in the sediments, and it's been found in all these places. So when we think about organisms, um, small organisms, the things I tend to spend a lot of time thinking about, um, little larval crabs, larval fish, oysters, copepods, um, all can ingest plastic. And what you're seeing here, these little green colored specks are um, fluorescently labeled pieces of plastic. 
that have been ingested by, by these organisms. We know that small organisms will eat um, microplastics. And I should say they'll also um, uh, release it in their feces, so it can go through them um, as well. We know that there are some negative effects from these processes. Um, ingestion is really the major concern for microplastics, not entanglement or the organisms getting caught in the material, it's they're ingesting the material. Um, and we know that there can be physiological or behavioral effects of this ingestion, the most important of which is probably the disruption of normal feeding and nutrition. If all you ever ate was cheeseburgers and you never touched a salad, your nutrition level would not be what it needs to be for growth and, and ultimately moving into the next generation. So um, these, these little cartoons down here are just showing you some data from an experiment um, where um, these copepods, these little, little marine animals, were ingesting food. And this is the control case. And this is the microplastic case. And you can see um, they're not eating as much good quality food, not as much carbon, not as much um, algal food um, when there's plastic around because they're also ingesting some plastic. And that's taking the, the, uh, the place of some food. It doesn't affect their energy um, expenditures, their metabolism. It doesn't affect their reproductive output, but it does affect their egestion, how much carbon moves through them. And so it's really about nutrition and feeding um, that, that the big issues are with small organisms. It seems like perhaps some immune and stress responses, perhaps some secondary effects from uh, compounds that are adsorbed to the material, the plastic that are stuck to it, or plasticizers that are leached out. But it really seems this normal, normal feeding disruption. It's possible there are food web effects as well. Um, so if you have smaller organisms eating the microplastic, those can transfer that material higher in the food web, although that's a little less uh, well established. So some big questions on microplastic pollution that I want to cover um, are here. So the first of which is, is early um, microplastic research really focused on garbage patches. But how much microplastic is in coastal waters that's closer to land? Because as I've said earlier on, it's this area near the land that's really the, the source of the plastic pollution. So that area closer to land in coastal waters, estuaries like Delaware Bay, for example, um, haven't really been studied in the same way as these garbage patches have. So knowing this is going to help us understand the local and regional scope of the problem of plastic pollution and then prioritize remediation efforts. Second question is what kinds of microplastics, the shape and type, are most commonly seen? That's important for knowing um, just because understanding where the material comes from, um, which is, is going to be determined in part by its shape and its type, its plastic formulation, um, that, that's going to help us figure out where the material comes from. And then also we can design laboratory experiments that get at biological effects if we know the shape and the type of the material. And then lastly, how is the microplastics distributed in space and time? So if we know that, we can then predict where microplastics are found and then understand the actual concentrations that organisms get exposed to, and then in turn estimate biological effects and try to look at impact on ecosystem health. So we've been engaged since around 2014 in looking at Delaware Bay, particularly the zooplankton in Delaware Bay. Um, and then um, through some conversations with Delaware Sea Grant and the state of Delaware um, through the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, um, we um, started asking the question, are microplastics an environmental concern in Delaware Bay? Because they hadn't been studied really in, in coastal systems by and large um, very much in particularly the east coast of the US and in Delaware Bay really not at all. And so we started this, uh, started this investigation then. And so we've approached this in a few fundamentally different ways. The first is observations from boats. And so let me just play this video briefly. Um, so what we're seeing is our research vessel um, right here, and it's towing a net behind. And you can see as we sort of move forward, we're looking at it from above. Um, you can see us passing a little aggregation area where, um, where um, there may be higher plastic concentrations than the areas around. That's one of the things that we found. And so um, again, this is sort of one of the techniques. We go out and make observations from boats, collect plastic. We use nets, we use pumps, um, we use various, various collection methods. Um, but um, so that's one, one, one way to do it. The issue with that though, is these are isolated observations from isolated areas. And really we wanna know um, in a broader scale what the distribution of plastic material is like. So then enter in uh, my colleague, Tobias Kokolka and his students 
um, who've done a lot of great work using computer simulations um, in this study of plastic. And so what we're seeing here is the plastic concentration as we predict it for Delaware Bay. And you can see the movement of that material in and out with the tides, and then ultimately coming from the Delaware River down here out in the Atlantic Ocean. These little red dots are particles that we're tracking. You can consider them um, organisms, um, little crab larvae or uh, fish larvae or, or copepods. Um, that we're, we're looking at how they interact with the plastic. So they can be included in the modeling effort as well. So observations and simulations are really how we, how we have been doing this work. So what have we learned? How much microplastic is in Delaware Bay? Um, so this is an example of some of the kind of data we collect. Um, so this is a map of Delaware Bay and each of these circles represents um, the concentration of microplastic at a station that we've sampled. Um, so um, if we look here, you see some, not all of the circles are the same size. So let's take a look at what kind of comes out here. Um, we see more plastic upstream. So um, this is perhaps not surprising. This is where higher population densities are. Um, Wilmington is up here, Camden, New Jersey, Wilmington, um, Dover is down here. Um, so um, we see higher plastic uh, where there's higher population densities but it's a little bit more involved with that. And I'm gonna spend time in, a, in a, a later slide going through this, but the physics of the estuary, of how the water moves in the estuary where fresh water is coming down and is meeting with salt water, um, that I think has to do with some of this um, concentration here as well. So there's almost a trapping effect in the upper bay. So we'll go into that. Additional inputs perhaps from Dover area, the murder kill in the St. Jones River, which are these lines here, um, could be contributing to the plastic we see on the Delaware shore, <clears throat> which is certainly higher than what we see in the Central Bay and on the New Jersey shore. Um, again, I want to return to that later as well. And then the other point I just wanted to make is that um, the plastic does seem to follow major currents, uh, particularly along the Delaware coast from, from upstream along the Delaware coast and then out towards the mouth of the bay. Um, so it seems like this material perhaps that's being trapped in the upper bay does get moved particularly along the Delaware coast and then out and then um, trapped a little bit off Cape May. And this is, could be at the function of the major currents that are moving through the bay, as well as tidal movement within the bay. So overall, we see an unexpected amount of variability across Delaware Bay in terms of the microplastic concentrations. And just to put a number to it, we're looking at you know, a few pieces um, uh, per cubic meter. So that's about two bathtubs. Uh, worse. So it's not an overwhelming concentration, but um, in, in cases it's, it's actually higher than what you see in the open ocean. So I mentioned that the upper Delaware Bay might trap microplastics. And so um, this is a cartoon image of what we call the estuarine turbidity maximum. So it's a common feature of estuaries like Delaware Bay, where you have fresh water from land drainage meeting um, salt water from the ocean. And so this is not a unique system in Delaware Bay. So we think this is fairly generalizable. And so as you have fresh water coming down, um, again, it's meeting with salty water, and then there's this, um, this sort of turbulence that, which can trap material in that, in that region. And it does for sediment, we know that, um, suspended um, material. And so it seems like plastic might be in that, same, in that same situation. So here, what I'm showing you again, these circles, these black circles represent um, plastic concentration. So the bigger the black circle, the more plastic. And I'm showing you in this case, um, a series of stations that we've sampled. Each of these vertical lines represents three different depths that we sampled. And as you see, um, when we're up near Wilmington, which is this small little dot here, which is in the blue area, the blue color represents uh, fresher water and the red represents saltier water. And you can see the fresher water is laying on top of the saltier water being pushed upstream. And so what you can also see though, is that we have higher concentrations of material in this estuarine turbidity maximum zone and less above that, where even though there's more urbanization and more pollution, presumably, um, there seems to be this trapping of material um, in this estuarine turbidity maximum zone, particularly lower in the water column, where it seems to be trapped and, and caught in that, in that circulation. So this is something we're actively investigating, um, but it's coming out of our, of our observations fairly strongly. So if we turn to what plastic shapes and types we see in Delaware Bay, um, We've, we've sampled um, quite a bit, and what comes out of our studies in the bay is the presence of fragments. So these would be uh, secondary microplastics that were larger and are broken down 
into, um, into fragments of larger material. That's most of what we see. Um, easily over half, two thirds of what we see can be fragments. Fibers are the next largest class. So these might've come from fabrics. They might also have come from some fragmented material that when it breaks down further, breaks down into fibers. Uh, we also see some thin films as well as beads, microbeads. Um, and so that's the, the overall shapes in the bay are primarily fragments and fibers. But then we can ask the question, what, what plastic formulations do we see? And so when we do that, um, the colors in this graph are showing you that. This is the number of plastic pieces in a subsample of our material that was sampled to reflect the relative proportions of fragments and fibers and films and beads that we see. But you're gonna notice a lot of oranges and a lot of grays. The, the grays are polyethylene and the oranges are polypropylene. And so polyethylene and polypropylene are the dominant uh, plastic formulations or types of material that we see. Um, again, this could come from plastic bottles. It could come from, uh, from um, ropes and other materials as well. It's a little hard to exactly get at the sources, um, but it's something that we're, we're trying to look into. So if we then turn to the computers, I just wanna make the point that computers can help us fill in gaps in terms of, of where the plastic actually is. So in this particular computer model I'm gonna show you, um, we've covered the Delaware Bay with a layer of buoyant plastic particles, and then we turn the model on and let the plastic float um, wherever the currents and waves and wind push it. Again, this is work that's being led by my colleague Tobias Kokoka uh, and his student Alan Mason. So if we turn this model on, here's what happens. So the plastic or the, the positively buoyant particles meant to, meant to uh, reflect plastic, very quickly gather in these very defined um, uh, layers and, and um, hot spots. And so let me just play that one more time. So we start out with an even layer of plastic and it gets, um, it gets spread out into these very defined hot spots. Here on the right, you can see the concentrations in these lines really that are happening where fresh water meets salt water at these, at these edges or fronts. And so um, it's not a homogeneous layer of plastic in the bay, rather it's very defined hotspots. And so that's our main result from our computer work is that buoyant particles are not just spread throughout the bay, but rather we think plastic is actually present in hotspots that are concentrated where salty and fresher water are mixing. And so we wanted to follow up on that and ask the question about where the material might be coming from that we see in the bay. And so one, thought based on what I presented earlier was that it should be coming from land and that tidal rivers, in addition to the Delaware River, um, other rivers going into the bay might provide some of that material. And so we asked the question, are tidal rivers sources of microplastics to Delaware Bay? And I want to show you one example of a study that we've been doing that, that goes into that. And so we've worked on the Murderkill River, um, which is here. Um, so again, we're in this area here near Dover, Delaware. Um, and if we look at this river, the Murderkill River, um, we've sampled a series of stations. I just want to point out that MK3, this one dot right here, is at a wastewater treatment plant effluent. So one of the things we were interested in in this particular case was whether this, um, this area showed us a higher plastic signal coming from wastewater treatment plant effluent that might have clothing fibers, things like that, um, relative to the rest of the river. But in general, we were really after whether the river was was a source higher than the bay. And so this is just a Google Earth view of that where I can show you that the town of Frederica is here. Um, this is a highway route one, the wastewater treatment plant effluent is coming in here, and then eventually we're gonna reach Delaware Bay downstream. And so my student Hayden Betcher sort of took the lead on this work, um, and here he is sampling in, um, in the Murderkill River. And we see lots of plastic material. Again, the same usual suspects, fibers, fragments, beads, um, rubber as well, um, but in slightly different proportions than what we saw in Delaware Bay. And so on um, this graph, um, it's a little, little, little much to look at. I know if you're not used to looking at these things, but this is microplastic concentration here on this y-axis. And these are the stations. Again, MK5, the one on the far right for each of these subpanels, is the upstream station going downstream. I've summarized it in words for you here. Um, we see that fibers are the most common um, microplastic in the river. You, you'll realize that's different than what we saw in Delaware Bay. In Delaware Bay, it was fragments, but in the rivers, 
um, its fibers. And we see this not just in the murder kill, but we see it in other rivers that we've sampled as well, the St. Jones River, the Bronx Hill River, and others. Um, so this is a common feature. It's also common in other regions where similar things have happened in terms of scientific studies. The Chesapeake, there's been a smattering of work there as well, and also some of the same, same, um, same things have come out where fibers are more common in the rivers, fragments more common in um, the larger bodies of water in the bays. So we see fragments are high, or excuse me, fibers are higher. You can see these concentrations are, are higher for the fibers. Fragments are next in their abundance. We do see things like beads and rubbers, but we see opposite patterns of where we see them. So for example, we see rubbers in higher concentration near um, Route 1, the highway, upstream, uh, presumably coming from tire rubber um, wearing off and getting into the water. Whereas downstream, we see more beads. Um, again, this is near the beaches on Delaware Bay, where uh, we think the beads might be aggregating in the sands um, of those beaches. We don't see a very strong signal from the wastewater treatment plant at, at MK3, which I think is a good sign in this particular case. So it's not that there's a huge input from that wastewater treatment plant. It might be that that contributes to these overall levels of material, but we're, we're looking into that more closely. But I do wanna draw your attention to the, the fact that these concentrations of microplastics are five to 10 times higher um, in the rivers than what we see in Delaware Bay. So it, it just reinforces this idea of material coming from the land and entering um, into the bay system. So it's also interesting to look at, at animals and effects on animals. And so um, when we do that, um, we find microplastics everywhere we look in biota. Um, we see them in blue crabs, we see them in mussels, we see them in fish, menhaden, bay anchovies. Um, and one of the ways that we've done this is we've incorporated microplastic sampling into our classes. And so I co-teach a class that uses sampling for microplastics as a teaching tool for undergraduates. And we've had them work with, with many of these and more species um, looking at microplastics and we find them. So here are just some examples of, of where we, what, what kind of things we see. We predominantly see fibers and we often see those fibers getting caught in the gill structures or the feeding structures um, for, these, for these organisms. Um, we've looked at, at digestive glands as well and sort of stomachs and intestines. Um, you can see them there occasionally as well, but um, the gills are what really has struck out uh, for us in terms of, uh, of uh, where we see the plastic material and again, particularly fibers. So the other thing that we've been doing um, is using uh, an ecological risk assessment framework to try to understand uh, plastic pollution. And so I've already mentioned modeling and observations. What that can give us is an exposure level for organisms. And we couple that with laboratory experiments on survival and growth to try to understand how, um, how different concentrations of plastic will affect organisms. And we put that together in um, a measure of risk. This is very much work in progress, but I wanted to share it with you just to give a sense of how you might be able to put together all these pieces that I've been discussing. And so if we know the concentration field for plastic, what we can then do is say, for an organism that lives its life moving about the system, how might, it, um, how might its life exposure to plastics be, or how might the response to, how might the exposure level be at every point of its life? Um, and then we can say, okay, well, this, this concentration of plastics might be detrimental, and we know that these organisms experience this concentration for this proportion of their lives. And we can then use that to understand, ultimately, uh, population level. Um, responses. And we've been looking at copepods and crabs, blue crabs in particular. Um, what I'll show you today, though, um, won't be too much in that area, except for the idea that if you take this image of Delaware Bay, and again, in the model world that um, Dr. Kokulka and, and uh, um, Alan Mason have been working on, is you can take these individual red spaghetti lines. Each one of these is an individual animal over the course of its life moving throughout Delaware Bay, the yellow line is the sort of the group average of all those. And what we can then do is we can say, this is the concentration, the mean exposure for an individual over the course of its life as it's moving around Delaware Bay. And we can follow that for individuals. And then we can then um, relate that to um, how, much, how much of a plastics concentration would affect those individuals negatively from aspects of their biology and physiology. Um, so that's the direction that we're heading with these, with these risk assessments. So research going forward, um, we're trying to relate land use to microplastics concentrations in waterways. That's getting at the sources 
of this material, ultimately we can then uh, make recommendations on places to prioritize uh, cleanup efforts and remediation efforts. We want to understand hotspots, these areas where microplastics aggregate so we can understand the fate and transport of the material. And we finally want to understand microplastic organism interactions and the ecological consequence of microplastics in coastal environments in particular. Zooplankton, fish, shellfish, um, and blue crabs are sort of the things that we focused on, but, um, but uh, there are plenty of, other, plenty of other studies out there looking at uh, other organisms as well. So I want to finish um, by spending some time just thinking about what are some of the most meaningful actions that might be used to address microplastics pollution. Um, it's an important thing to think about, and, um, and, I, and I think I'm not necessarily going to come to any firm conclusions, but I want to just raise some issues um, and get, get you thinking a little bit. So um, one thing that's been brought up is, well, maybe we can just vacuum up the ocean plastic. Um, and just get rid of it that way. Well, uh, various non-governmental organizations have led initiatives to do this, um, the ocean cleanup. If you're familiar in Baltimore, kind of near the aquarium, there's the Mr. Trash Wheel that collects um, uh, trash coming into Baltimore Harbor. Um, these things might work in really local situations, but again, I, I mentioned that the microplastic issue perhaps is a bit bigger than you could, you could capture with this. Um, then comes the issue of, well, maybe we need to reduce global consumption of single-use plastics. Uh, because again, remember, a lot of that plastic material is going into packaging, and then it's going straight into, into the waste stream. Um, and so there's been various US, European, and Asian initiatives at the local through national levels um, to deal with reductions of single-use plastics. Um, some of this requires changes in consumer behavior. Here in Southern Delaware, we've had you know, various sort of bag initiatives, um, sort of uh, uh, trying to, to promote uh, reusable bags as, as other places have as well. It's resulted in um, bag bans in many states, Delaware is one of them. Although interestingly with the current COVID epidemic, some of those bag bans have been put on pause or, um, or, or uh, reversed. Um, so again, but this is a, involves consumer behavior, which is part of the, part of the solution. Other changes, though, require manufacturer behavioral changes. So, for example, banning microbeads from personal hair or personal products, uh, care, personal health care products, happened in the U.S., the U.K., and, and elsewhere. Um, so, those are sort of a both consumer and manufacturer behavior change is probably is probably needed. Um, these are all well intentioned, but I do wonder whether they're enough. And so, this cartoon um, sort of gets at the the idea. Well, yeah, I mean, you may be you may be reducing one thing, but, but there's always going to be something else. And so um, I do wonder whether that's enough. And so maybe we need to think bigger. Um, so one thought has been um, increasing the global waste management capacity. Again, if mismanagement of waste is really the problem, making it so that we have less mismanaged waste is probably the biggest solution. Um, and this has been work looked at at national and corporate levels in particular. Uh, plastic manufacturers have been getting on board trying to help countries conduct waste audits. Um, companies are also using ocean plastic, in quotes, um, as a marketing and packaging um, element. So uh, product packaging that's made with ocean plastic and then marketing that fact. Um, so that's part of it. Um, another part has really sort of focused on um, trying to make recycling, um, which I've already sort of said is, is probably uh, minimal but to try to make um, recycling have increased value and also get back at the social justice side of what I mentioned earlier to try to um, increase the value of recycling for uh, poor communities. And so uh, promoting links between um, wealthier and poorer communities in particular. And the Plastic Bank is an example of an organization that's, that's trying to do that, try to incentivize and cycle, recycling at, at the local level. Then there's also innovation and um, the idea of upcycling of plastic waste. So um, this is coming up in engineering circles in particular to try to make um, plastic waste um, uh, be more valuable. And so um, increase not just the capacity for recycling, but what you can turn that material into, make it a more valuable material. And so this is thought of as, as fostering a circular economy. So innovation has a part to play as well. 
So just to wrap up, um, I wanted to make the um, make you aware of a website um, under the scope.udel.edu, um, which is a website that we use for highlighting various work that um, my research group and others are involved in. It has lots of resources for plankton, um, if you're interested in that, and also microplastics and uh, various other projects that we do, um, and also lesson plans for incorporating data from our projects in the classroom. And then there's a, a new one that we're working on with our microplastics data. I'm just doing a screenshot of it here. It's a web-based um, a web-based data analysis exercise, but it can also be done um, paper-based as well if, if you want to do that and you're a teacher. Uh, feel free to contact me um, and I can, can share more of those details with you. So this is a, a good resource for a lot of this work. And I just want to finish um, with sort of a bittersweet image. Um, so on the upper left are diatoms, so little marine organisms that in the Victorian era, it was very common to um, sort of move these things around under the microscope as sort of a, a Victorian pastime of making very pretty pictures on microscope slides. So these are very small, small um, objects, you know, maybe you know, a quarter of an inch, half an inch by half an inch. So really small, teeny little things. Um, then down here on the right is sort of the new version of that. So these are all plastic material. Um, that's been arranged again in this in this pretty pattern. So um, it's a little a little bittersweet to me, but also I think you know reflects the um, the idea that the more we look into the ocean, perhaps the more we start to understand it. Um, and getting at that small scale um, of microplastics is really the way to I think to think about plastic pollution at least in the marine environment. So with that, I'll thank you, and I think we have some time for questions. So I'll be happy to uh, to turn it over to I believe Mark uh, Jolly and uh, and handle questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. Appreciate your uh, lecture and sharing your research with us all. We do have a couple questions, and I want to remind everybody as we get started that you can add them now. There's a Q and A feature down at the bottom of your screen. You open that up and type the questions right in. I'm going to do my best to, to get through the number that we can and, and try to aggregate them. Um, we have a number of questions to start off, Dr. Cohen, about uh, your sampling and modeling, so some kind of technical interest. Um, maybe the simplest place to start is what's the minimum size of microplastics that you can detect you know, with your collection methods? How small are you actually getting? Yeah, so the the observations that I showed you today were all done with a 200 micron uh, net. And so um, if you take a whole water sample, you can get smaller um, because you're not limited by the mesh size of the net. Um, we, there's, a, there's always a conflict with how much volume you sample. And so we opt uh, for our studies, we, we change it around depending on the exact question of the particular study but our, our sort of go-to method is a 200 micron mesh net that we, that we drag through the water um, at different depths. And so that's the um, sort of the operational size limit. And then we'll use sieves to size fractionate that even more. So we have sort of smaller and larger size fractions. You'll notice I put up a 300 micron um, sort of lower limit for the, the size ranges that I showed you. But if we do sort of whole water samples, then, um, we can, we're limited then by how we detect the particles. And so we've often, we'll just use visual observations. So with that, you know, we're maybe 50 to 100 microns would be, would be the best we could do. It becomes really hard to figure out if it's exactly plastic at that point, but now we're using some other techniques um, that are like what we use to determine the plastic polymer composition. And those can get us down to about 10 microns. Um, so relatively small, there are some smaller things out there, but you're, you're collecting quite far down. And it's a good question because the, the biological availability is going to be a little bit more in that smaller size range, particularly for the smaller biota. Um, you know, some of the fish, for example, could, could eat a larger piece of plastic. But if you're talking about an oyster, you know, the preferred size range of food for an oyster is going to be sort of maybe 5, 10, 20 microns, right? Um, so it's, it is important. That size question is, is an important one. Actually, and that was something I'd wondered about listening to your, to your talk why are you looking at the organisms that you're you're looking at, right? So certain fin fish, shellfish, and then zooplankton, you know, these very small marine animals you were talking about at the beginning. What's the importance of these creatures and why are they the ones you're studying? Yeah, so the, the zooplankton in particular, 
um, are sort of the base of the animal food chain. And so they eat the phytoplankton, the primary producers, and then they package up that, that energy from the sun through the phytoplankton into you know, animal carbon. And then that moves through the fish larvae and larger fish. And so they're also of the right size class to interact with microplastic um, and in terms of feeding. And so um, they're sort of the most intimately connected with it. And so that's one reason why we focus on the zooplankton. We've been focusing on blue crabs because of the economic and cultural importance of that particular organism to our region. And also because they go through life stages um, that, that put them in the zooplankton group as well. And so they spend you know, the first month or so of their lives in the zooplankton, not looking at all like a crab that you would eat. Um, but then they start looking like that after about a month. And they spend time in the bay as well as in the coastal ocean and then come back to the bay. And so they're a, sort of a, a, an organism that's experiencing very different uh, ocean habitats as well. And so it, it creates, um, uh, creates a useful study organism for us uh, because of that reason. But it's a balance of ecological and economic importance that help us choose study organisms. And are you um, starting to learn anything that you can say about microplastics moving, moving up the food chain? Um, we have a question here specifically asking about birds. You know, if there's birds that have fish as part of their diet, do we see it accumulating and moving up the chain that way? So we haven't looked at birds in particular. There definitely have been, have been studies, particularly in the Pacific, looking um, around the garbage patches of plastics and birds. We haven't looked in our region um, at that. Um, there's some big questions about the extent to which trophic transfer of microplastics occurs. The scientific community hasn't come to a consensus on that. So I was at a meeting in February where this came up um, and there was there were a few studies that are that are looking at this now and it's it's unclear the extent to which trophic transfer is occurring. Um, presumably it does in certain places, but in, in others it may not. Um, so I think that's a big question. And then also um, sort of the extent to which it would occur in the food web. Um, so how much, how much transfer is there? It's completely open. So even without, without transfer being the method, can you say anything about are there particular organisms or particular size organisms that are the worst affected by plastics in the ocean? So one of the ones that, that's interesting to us um, that from our work um, is are fil her filter feeders, right? So anything that's going to be filtering the water non-selectively um, is going to bring the water in and it's going to interact with plastic. Um, although there are often, there's, there's plenty of, of um, non-organic material, sediment, sand grains, that these organisms would also routinely encounter and they have ways to get rid of it. And plastic probably falls into that category as well. But again, if there are plasticizers or other materials um, you know, um, that are adsorbed, um, other toxicants absorbed, then that could make its way into, into the biota. Um, but I think filter feeders for us, when we've seen it in menhaden, um, which again are sort of a filter feeding fish and getting on their gills, I think that um, is interesting for us. And other studies have looked at menhaden as well, in, in South Carolina in particular, and have also seen a lot of plastic in the menhaden. Um, menhaden are also just ground up um, when they're used um, um, for the menhaden fishery. Um, which isn't a, isn't what like it used to be, uh, but um, but so in that case, then that material would just be sort of brought into that into that um, into that food source. So that's one that I think is interesting to think about um, in this area in particular. You say ground up is that um, like supplements or pet food or uh, what's the what's the ultimate use of? Menhaden? Yeah, it's been for oils in the past. It's been used for oils and for paint um, paint oils and and um, and yeah poultry food and, and, and other things, makeup. Um, speaking of those filter feeders, we got a question about uh, whether you're seeing plastics in oysters. I think you touched on this, but this person noticed on your model that the hotspots seem to be over on the New Jersey coastline, the kind of eastern side of the Delaware Bay where there's a lot of harvest. Are you seeing yeah. it affect that fishery? Yeah, so um, the model definitely showed that. And we see that, um, we don't see that as much in the observations. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're trying to understand by changing the parameters of the model. Um, we're, we're comfortable that these, that these hotspots are created, but what we're not as clear about is what are the factors that move the hotspots one way or another. And so what we've been really actively trying to do is to go out and sample across the tide between places where we expect a hotspot to be and don't expect the hotspot to be. 
and just going back and forth between those locations to try to capture that hotspot and to try to purposefully go out and find them. So that's one question that I've often had as well. And we have a new project that's just getting started, um, funded by Delaware Sea Grant, that's specifically trying to find hotspots and then look at biota associated with them. And then what, what that question really gets at, I think is one of the things that we wanna to try to specifically look at. I was to try to relate the hotspot to the biota and see if there's a connection there. But, but I would caution too that the hotspot in the model is, it's, our, it's a good guess, but it's dependent on the wind and the discharge from, from the river. And so that's what's gonna kind of cause that to move around and, and we're, we're actively investigating that. So we've got audience members noticing things you've also noticed and started to- start Yeah, yeah. Sampling is happening, you're finding stuff on the Delaware shore, modeling's gonna show, showing up at the New Jersey shore. Yep. Yeah, um, and that, that difference is really interesting to us. And, and yeah, it's nice to see that, see someone else pick up on it as well. But yeah, that difference between the models and the observations and for us as scientists, that's actually the interesting part. Like we don't, you don't necessarily want the model to be exactly what your observations are, I don't think, because then you don't really learn anything about the system. But by seeing what doesn't actually work and what, what, what's the difference between your observations and your, and your model is kind of the fertile area of, of, of uh, the science. So that's, that's what's fun for us. Figure out why it's different. It's yeah. interesting stuff. Um, a couple questions about, and, and this may uh, get back to some of the uncertainty you're talking about, about trophic transfer, but do we know anything yet about whether microplastics present a health hazard for humans eating seafood? Have there been studies of consumer seafood products to see if we're seeing microplastics within them? Yeah, and a lot of that has come with the development of new techniques to look for microplastics. And so um, some of the more recent studies have used um, different chemical techniques to what we use. So we're interested in finding the individual microplastics in our samples and in our tissue. Um, other techniques have, are using chemical approaches that just look at the presence of certain chemical constituents. And so um, is there polyethylene in there? Is there polypropylene in there? Whereas I wanna know there's this many particles of polyethylene and it's this size because I then wanna think about the interaction with the organisms. But in terms of the seafood um, testing that's going on, a lot of it is moving towards that just presence of the material. And so, at least from what I've seen, it's a little too early to kind of come down and, and say that, uh, whether, you know, in terms of human health risk. But um, there's definitely, from the studies I've seen, uh, particularly at scientific meetings, um, there, are, there are better and better techniques at picking up plastic in seafood, and it's picked up readily. But then, but then it's another jump to talk about human health. So I think that that work is still, um, still on the table. Kind of a, a chain of investigations that have to happen to answer those questions yet. And a lot of it comes back to the difficulties in, in the study. It's a pretty new field. You know, it's only, again, the past five to 10 years that people have really started to understand microplastics as an issue and then how to, how to move forward with it. And so um, part of that has been trying to work out the best methods to, to answer some of these questions. And, and people are coming at this from a variety of fields, which is great. It's great to have that diversity. But at the same time, it makes it hard to compare studies if everyone's doing it very differently. And so I think we're finally getting to the point where there's starting to become a consensus about the way to approach these investigations to at least have um, a way to compare across studies. And so um, I think in the next five years, I think we'll see, you know, again, exponential growth, not just in the types of studies, but the utility of those studies to really get at these questions of, of human and ecosystem health. There was actually a question about process that you kind of started to allude to see if you have more to say on the topic. Somebody wanted to know how much coordination or sharing of what you've learned and the processes do you do, you know, do, do universities share back and forth the research facilities within the U.S. and across the world? Are you yeah. sharing techniques and findings and things of that sort? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the way science works is there's some of that baked into the scientific process of going to meetings. Um, but what I found in being involved in various you know, types of science over the years. Um, and as Joe Scudlark mentioned at the beginning, you know, my work is sort of neurobiology and physiology as well as plastics and environmental sampling. Um, it's, so I've been involved in different types of science and microplastics work is one which is incredibly um, sort of well shared because everyone realizes that, that it's an issue that 
no one group is going to sort of know everything about. It's I think uh, people working in different systems with different approaches um, are going to come at the the problem a little differently, and collectively we'll understand it better if we talk to each other. And so um, whether it's at scientific meetings or offline with people, um, everyone is really willing to share data, um, to share approaches, to share pitfalls. Um, so I've found that you know this community of researchers is incredibly um, collegial uh, and willing to to work with each other. I'm seeing maybe some evidence of of these different approaches and ways of thinking about it in the questions. We've got a couple geologists who've joined us, um, including our our dean, who's curious about whether you've looked at microplastics in sediments at all. Have you done any grab samples or cores? Um, have you have you looked at it from that angle? You know, it's funny, um, I was just thinking yesterday that we need to start doing that. So I've sort of laid off sediments um, because I've had another uh, uh, colleague uh, who, at the state who started doing that, looking at beach samples and, and grab samples. Um, and so we didn't do that um, to sort of not step on toes. But, um, but I think that maybe we are gonna start doing some of that because I think the questions that we have, particularly about in the estuarine turbidity maximum, where we're seeing more material than we expected deeper in the water column. We really want to know how much of that material is making it to the benthos and interacting with benthic organisms. And so um, it's sort of part of our, our next wave of, of sampling um, will involve um, grab samples, um, maybe some coring to try to look at um, in areas where we know that there should be movement from the sur of material from the surface to deeper layers. Um, and interaction with biota, sort of what, what does that look like at the benthos? So I've tried to avoid it. Um, it's messy, it's hard to do, water is easier, organisms are easier, but we're about to bite the bullet and, um, and do it. We have uh, maybe one more technique kind of question, and then I, we got a lot of questions about um, what people can do, so I am, gonna, I am gonna get to those. But since we're on this topic, uh, also had a question about what information is available about the chemistry of natural or pollutant compounds adsorbed to plastic particles. Yeah. Do the particles help to concentrate compounds or vice versa? So it's been, um, it's been, that was an early question in, in sort of the microplastics world. And it's one that to my mind hasn't been um, sufficiently resolved. Um, there, are, there are a few studies looking at biological interactions and one really interesting one where um, if you have microplastics present, the, um, the the mortality response of, in this case, it was copepods to the pollutant, which would absorb, I think it was um, um, PAHs, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, was less in the copepods when the plastic was present. So in that way, it was actually, uh, the plastic was pulling the material out and becoming less biologically available to the, the organisms. And so um, there's the possibility for that but there's also the possibility for ingesting and then um, potentially leaching those uh, compounds to the organisms. There was a study with black sea bass um, that, that I don't think it's been published yet, but that found that at least in terms of plasticizers, there was fairly minimal loss of the plasticizer as the material went through the gut of the organism. Um, and then kind of a mixed bag of studies looking at you know, adsorbed um, organic compounds in particular. So I think the possibility is real um, but the data to suggest that it occurs and it has a big impact is is not there yet. And and this is this is related. And I apologize if maybe you've addressed this a little bit already. But we've had someone ask um, whether there are you know toxic components uh, or, or what the most toxic or dangerous components would be coming from the plastic. So as the plastic breaks down, is it also adding chemicals into the organisms or the environment that would be dangerous? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that um, that may be going on is that there's the plastic itself, but then there's a lot of additives, whether there's colorants or um, just the plasticizers themselves. Um, so phthalates in particular that give the plastic its material properties. Um, there's some concern about those compounds actually being worse than just the the plastic itself, um, and I think that's a direction that the people that are that are working on this um, are taking more seriously. So that black sea bass study I mentioned um, had a, a phthalate component to it. Uh, but I think those, that, that's presumably the plasticizers are, are that can have um, endocrine disrupting effects, um, other developmental effects, um, and just mortality effects. 
And so I think that's a, that's a real one to think about. So kind of as you were talking about earlier, there's a lot still to be discovered, but things that would make sense to, to look at that could be harming organisms in, in different ways. Um, we are a little bit past eight, um, but if everybody's okay to stay for a little while, I got a couple more questions for you. I do want to ask, because um, we've had a couple of people raise it uh, in terms of what can be done. Um, I'll start maybe with the specific and then you can end with the general. We've had someone ask or point out that in Europe, um, packaging, uh, the, the uh, I should just read it as is. In Europe, packaging users for their products are made responsible for getting the packaging back and disposing of it responsibly. Is there any um, call to do that in the US? Any, any reason that's you know, a good approach, a bad approach? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, um the it's it's certainly worth a discussion to figure out ways to improve the waste management stream and at least i mean in our in our society um in our country the that that process starts locally right and so um where municipalities are responsible for managing their waste streams and so um i think I think that's what makes it challenging is because you have all these municipalities um, who can do things a little bit differently. It's really hard as a consumer, um, at least I felt this way, that to figure out what's recyclable, what's not recyclable, how do I, um, and then that changes over time. And so I feel like um, the consumer, if the consumer had more responsibility for some of that as the question gets at. I think it seems like it, it seems to me would be a good thing. Um, I do think that, that there's a lot of interaction that's gonna need to happen with state and local governments to make it clear to consumers where products should go um, at a minimum for, for the recycling stream. And I've, I've been seeing improvement on that and I know the state of Delaware is, is working on it as well. Um, so I think that's a, that's a, it's a good area to, to improve. I don't, I don't know um, how, how likely it will be that the consumer becomes completely responsible for getting the packaging where it needs to go, but um, but I think that there's a there's scope for improvement for sure. There was a, a question too or a comment somewhere about uh, the kind of coastal cleanups you see, um, right? The, the international coastal cleanup. There's other ones in Delaware um, at different times a year. How effective are those? Is that a useful tool? Um, to yeah. At that level. I think I think there's there's a few levels that that's a useful tool. Um, one is from just getting a longitudinal assessment of, excuse me, of the waste that we see on waste litter on beaches. I think you know um, I go back and I use those data and look at those data to try to get a sense of you know what the what the dominant items are. How does that compare with what we're seeing in the water? Um, we are specifically going to release um, in a new project release drift cards that float. Um, and are biodegradable, but that could be could be collected during the coastal cleanup to act as sort of pseudo plastics to then let us understand where plastic material would end up, where neutrally buoyant material would end up, so we can validate some of the modeling work. So I think there's a there's a huge role for those cleanups, but one of the biggest is really just to get people out and interacting with the waste because the more people um, experience it and see what's out there, I think the more um, the more people are to to act responsibly when it comes to managing their own waste. And so I think there's just a sort of a social impact of having those kind of cleanups and advertising them and showing what what comes of them. Yeah, it makes, makes the problem a little more real when you go yeah. pick it up with your own hands, right? Right. Um, yeah. yeah, and so maybe, maybe we can close on kind of where these are headed. We have a couple of specific suggestions, and then we've got at least two people who've just asked, you know, what can be done or what's the most effective most important thing that you know the average citizen, people just watching this lecture tonight, could do to to reduce the the plastics in the environment. Yeah, let me take one step back and just. <laughs> What's that? I know that's more of an opinion question than yeah. your science, yeah. but. Yeah. Uh, let me just take one step back and and just make a plug for the Delaware Coastal Cleanup for those in Delaware, um, which is tied to the International Coastal Cleanup, um, is in September, and so um, I think if you look um, at the the Del Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control is, um, um, puts that on. And so you can search for the coastal cleanup um, at their website if you're in Delaware, it's in September. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a balance of 
what I was trying to go through at the end, I mean, I guess my personal opinion is um, we're, I don't think the right idea is to just try to collect all the material in the environment, because I feel like if we don't turn off the tap, it's not going to solve the problem. And so um, I don't think just collecting the material in the environment is the way to go. I think in certain places, it's really important to do that, but it, it's, all, it's important to give you a sense of where the material is coming from and maybe to clean up certain areas, but that's not the overall solution. Um, I do think this is a global problem and there are ways to address it locally. We should certainly think about single use plastic and reducing plastic production and consumption, increasing the, um, the recyclability of material, um, but these are all sort of larger than the consumer. Um, making consumer choices that sort of emphasize um, reduced packaging or recyclable packaging are things we can do as consumers. But ultimately, what I would love to see is a more serious conversation at higher levels of the relationship, the social justice side of this at a global scale to poverty and plastic. Um, because I, I didn't go into it too much today, but I think that's something that is overlooked when you look at this as a global issue. Um, again, it's a little removed from what the individual can do on just a day-to-day -day basis, but I think that there's elements of that, um, of what the individual can do. There's elements of what we need to do as a nation and as a global community. Um, and so I feel like if we do all of that, then we might make a dent at the problem, but it's going to require consumer choices, business choices, governmental governmental choices. A complicated problem is going to need a, a complicated solution. Yeah. Well, we do um, have some more questions, but I know we've already run over and I want to want to thank you for your time and thank everybody for um, for kind of participating. If we weren't able to get your questions, I, I apologize. Um, obviously, a lot of interest in the topic. So, um, you know, keep your eye out. There may be more information. If you can participate in that cleanup in September, you could possibly even help with the research if the drifters are out. Um, but thank you all again. A uh, quick plug for the next Ocean Currents is two weeks from tonight. Uh, and if you haven't signed up yet, you'll be getting an email that will allow you to do that. So um, thank you again, Dr. Cohen, and to the audience. Have a good evening. Thank you all.